I'm Chris. Well, hi there. I'm Robert. And we're the Film Flamers, bringing you another hot take, this time on Stephen King's and Mike Flanagan's Dr. Sleep. I guess we could also say, and Kubrick's, right? I mean, yeah, he played a small part in the, the making of this film. His DNA is certainly in there. So uh, this is pretty exciting because it's going to be the hottest of all of our hot takes so far, I think. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, Suspiria was like a pretty hot take. It came out, an episode came out quickly after the movie was released, right? Yeah. So um, uh, at the time of this recording, it's the opening weekend for Dr. Sleep. And Chris and I both saw it. And this episode will come out about a week afterward. So pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's safe to say that Chris and I are both pretty excited to talk about this movie. Definitely. Well, I've always been a fan of Mike Flanagan. The first film I watched of his was Oculus, and I I loved it. And I I feel like uh, we've talked about this before, but a lot of people are either fans of Mike Flanagan films or they're not seems to be uh i think most people are Mm -hmm. but um and then of course you know we got i i never saw like ouija origin of evil um and i I saw a couple other things from him but mainly i saw the haunting of hill house last year on or actually this year i guess on netflix and uh it was spectacular we reviewed it we both loved it oh yeah um you know, and he's of course doing his sequel to that series, or kind of a American Horror Story style. Like every year, hopefully every year or two, he's going to do another story. This one's going to be on the turning of the screw of Bly Manor. So I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, this is his. Uh, oh, of course, he did Gerald's Game too. So this yep. is not his first Stephen King adaption. No, I'm actually a really big fan of Mike Flanagan's. I yeah. liked. I liked that Ouija movie. I thought it was good. I kind of like Before I Wake a lot too. It had uh, Jacob Tremblay in it from The Room, who also has a very small part in Doctor Sleep. I really enjoyed Hush, and I think it's like a Netflix exclusive at this point, right? But I, his movies are really good. Yeah, and I mean, most people that I talk to, at least fans of of horror films, don't have a lot negative to say about Mike Flanagan films. Certainly not uh, Haunting of Hill House. I know. And just based on some of the things that I've read on Twitter this weekend and people that I've talked to, people love Dr. Sleep. I mean, the people who have seen it, you know, and we'll, I think we'll talk about its, its release maybe a little bit later. But um, for those of you who have not seen the movie, we'll probably get into some spoilers here. So this is your fair warning. And um, uh, the movie itself is a uh, based on the book by Stephen King, which is a sequel to his novel, The Shining. Which is interesting to me because I've read some comments online where people seem to think that this is some sort of studio born project to, you know, keep on doing uh, sequels to popular franchises or trying to create a franchise or something else. But no, this is this is literally based on the book, which is the sequel to The Shining. So uh, I feel like that's something that I don't feel like the trailers or the advertising really kind of put across where it was, you know, a sequel to the book, but as well as uh, to Kubrick's The Shining. And they really tried to sell The Shining because I don't blame them because that's what people know. Exactly. Um, You know, but still, I'm seeing those comments where, oh, this is just a this is just a, you know, money grab or something like that. And no, this is based on the, the book. So and I mean it's it's pretty well known amongst horror fans and you know avid Stephen King readers how he feels about Kubrick's version of The Shining it varies vastly from his novel um, from characterization to outcomes plots you know all of it and um, he famously doesn't really care for that adaptation he went back and created a miniseries version. Um, he wrote the screenplay, the teleplay, and they got to make that. And so he had his full realization of The Shining, yeah. you know, in celluloid. But I go back and forth between loving and hating The Shining. It seems like every five years or so, I'll go and watch it again. And I'm like, oh, this movie's great. And then like a couple of years later, I'll watch it and be like, oh, no, it kind of sucks for whatever reason. But this movie just reminded me how much I loved The Shining, the movie and the book. And I just... Oh, this movie's so so Kubrick's The Shining is famous because of the moments that he created and the set pieces and everything in his mind beforehand. And it just goes to the strength of Kubrick that pulls together this movie <sighs> off of these choice scenes. You know, like him going up the stairs with that axe and, you know, breaking through and all of that stuff and the way it was shot and everything else. It makes that movie. Everything else that surrounds it, you know, like going through the pantry and saying what everything is and 
you know, like the stupid meeting with the fucking owner of the hotel or whatever. And Oh, and that office is the exact same yep, exact replica. Yeah. Cause I reached over mom. I was like, that's the same office. And she was like, from what? And I was like, the fucking shot. <laughs> 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 like what is the movie they were watching? <laughs> Sesame Street. <laughs> oh, so we were at the draft house, and they were. We went for the pre-show. I was like, "It's my mom's first time ever at the draft house," and um, I was like, "They show all these cool things beforehand," and so they showed that uh, video where they superimposed Jim Carrey's face over Jack Nicholson's, right? And we're sitting there watching it, and she was just like, that really doesn't look like Jack Nicholson at all to me. And I was like, because it's Jim Carrey. I was like, this is why I like going to the movies with you. <laughs> Anywho. Yeah, and Stephen King also mentioned that his style it was warm or hot, right? And Kubrick's is cold, which is kind of an interesting way to put it if you think about Kubrick's films versus you know, Stephen King's stories. He says in, the, in his Shining... You know, the Overlook burns in Kubrick Shining, the Overlook freezes. Mm -hmm. And it's also kind of that that style of storytelling. And so a lot of the human elements of the Shining in the film got lost in translation just, you know, because of Kubrick, Kubrick style. And of course, uh, Kubrick, you know, Kubrick's film is a classic as well. It should be. Um, from a technical standpoint and otherwise, it's a, a classic film, not just a classic horror film, right? So there was a, <laughs> needless to say, there was, you know, kind of two masters that Mike Flanagan kind of had to serve. He had certainly had to acknowledge Kubrick and what he had done, but he really wanted to stay faithful to the human warm elements of uh, Stephen King's stories. And I think he did a really good job with that. I mean, when I... <sighs> Because, I mean, I read Dr. Sleep when it was first released, and I liked the book quite a bit. And I've always been a fan of The Shining as a novel more than Kubrick's movie. I love it. I've seen it many, many times. But, I mean, it's different, and I just appreciate yeah. the book a lot more, which is usually the case when you see a movie that's based on a novel. Um, Dr. Sleep was a really good book. And I thought when I was reading it, there's just no way in the world that this is going to be a movie only because the original Shining movie exists. And Stephen King sort of picked up the story from where his book left off and not from where Kubrick left off in the movie. Yeah. And so I thought, well, this movie is never going to be made. And then when they announced they were making it, I'm like, well, he's got his work cut out for him. But it wasn't until that first trailer was released when we saw how much of the movie was going to be influenced by Kubrick and that first film. And I was like, well, I am very curious to see where this is going. So we were both kind of on the fence with that. Yeah. I mean, I was excited to see the movie. Would you say that you were beforehand? I mean, I, I was, but it just, it did seem kind of like, um, you know, okay, we have this thing. Let's do it. There's a book. We, there's even more reason to do it. Let's just do it like clockwork, you know, but as soon as I saw that Mike Flanagan was doing it and kind of realized that, all of a sudden I had a lot more faith in the project. Oh yeah. And uh, yeah. And here we are. So I, I ended up seeing this the, the night before you did. Yep. And of course I came out of the theater and had my reaction and all I could do was send him a thumbs up emoji. Cause I didn't want to like give him any like heightened expectation or anything like that. But that's like, I was just like blue balls, like needing to like, <laughs> <laughs> talk to someone about that movie and all i could do is send him a thumbs up emoji and then i i like texted him on like let me know when you've seen it and he was like i'm just walking out and uh yeah and he's like i'm crying right now i was like oh my god i was almost crying when i came out of the theater because it's so fucking good yes it just works it is it's just it's an amazing movie and to be honest i mean i was excited to see it based upon you know how much i liked the book and i was curious to see what he was going to do like melding the two worlds together so my expectations were sort of like middle ground not exactly super high and i was completely like i don't i can't even the word astonished at how, yeah. how good it was and how much i liked it and how emotional i felt while watching this movie and there's just so much going for it so much going on in it there's a great payoff from characterization, but also a great payoff from being a Stephen King fan and a fan of the Kubrick movie, right? I mean, yeah. like, there's a little bit of something in here for everybody. Now, I would have given it a five star. I had to give it a 4.5 just because there was a little bit, to me personally, 
uh, a little bit of heavy handedness uh, with the the Kubrick shining call outs and where it kind of took me out of the experience a little bit. Um, but honestly, I feel like that's not a huge, that's like a nitpick mm-hmm. because it was done so well. So I'm, I'm really anal about my ratings. So uh, that's the one thing of, if I can think of or spot one thing that I would change, that's not going to be a five out of five movie for me. So it's a four and a half and those are few and far between for me. Um, and I think for you, you said it was a five. Yeah. I mean, I, I was, I was going to debate for a little bit cause I was thinking, you know, we we were talking via text right after I watched the movie and I had some other errands to run and whatever. And this movie really stuck with me all day yesterday after I watched it. And today I keep thinking about it. And you and I review movies differently from each other. And I think that's what makes our podcast good, you know. But I really tend to to rate movies and like movies just based on my emotional response to it. And, and that's perfect. Yeah. And, and so like... Just, the sheer joy I got out of watching this movie and I was thinking about it and I was like, I'm excited to, to own this movie. I'm excited to watch this movie many, many times. Yeah. And I think all of that stuff goes into my, to my rating. And to me, this is the kind of movie that I will sit down and watch over and over again, very much like it chapter one, right? I've watched that many times since it came out and in other horror movies and other movies that are non horror. I mean, um, I tend to give out five star ratings a lot more frequently than you do. (laughs) That's true. But like, I wish I, was less anal i wish i was less ocd but like if i can pick something apart and think of how i would have done it differently and i think that would be better like it's gonna like bother me so i can't just give something a five i I think i've only given three films ever a five star but that's neither here nor there because honestly dr sleep is our recommendation is to go see it and go see it many many times oh yeah Honestly, I think that fans will be finding new things to like about this particular film forever and ever and ever. <laughs> I was so glad that we got to see them at some point in this movie, too, because it was the movie was almost over. And here we go with spoilers. Right. I was like, that's it. I will knock this movie down half a star if I don't see those fucking twins in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, honestly, the. <sighs> Everyone did really well. I mean, not just the bit characters. Um, you know, Ewan McGregor was great. The, the acting in this movie altogether really shines. <laughs> oh, nice. I see what you did there. Um, yeah, I have to agree. I thought Ewan McGregor's performance was very quiet and understated in the beginning of it. And he really came into his own with this particular character. And... Um, I really enjoyed Rebecca Ferguson. Yeah, I was just about as to say Rose the Hat. She was amazing and that is such an iconic villain. Yes. I did not expect that. I just the villains in the trailer, I was just like I saw her, you know. But it's it's the whole package. Like you have to see the film to understand. Like this is a really this is going to be a classic villain in film. She was so good in this movie i mean like really from start to finish i mean like she just really embodied that character so well and she just like i don't know this movie like i said before was very emotional for me i cried no less than three times in this movie and one of them was involving her you know there's a significant scene where she's separated from her group you know on purpose and she's dealing with a lot of emotional stuff and it really like humanizes that villain a little bit and i was just in tears watching her that's something he did a really good job with yes uh, was that he was able to kind of show the perspective of this group which is called the true knot kind of a cult of psychic vampires right right which is really awesome i haven't seen like you see psychics and like x-men and everything else but i haven't seen this kind of like astral kind of warfare um in a movie like it takes a little bit of what's already been done in like stephen king's uh, Dreamcatcher mm-hmm. a little bit and so he's kind of keeping his same tropes that he creates for what the mind looks like or can look like or act like and uh there's some scenes you know, that really, really depend on the acting and how they sell it, but also the set pieces. And there was one extremely awesome scene to me that I will never forget that I think Kubrick would be proud of, which is when she is uh, Rose the Hat, our villain, is traveling across the world psychically. And you see the planet kind of turning as she travels. She's on the left and the planet's on the right and the stars behind her and everything. And then she kind of zooms in and travels, you know, to to go find the the little girl who's this 
you know, giant psychic um, to, to hunt her down. And this is such an amazing scene visually. I just want to see that. I, I'd go back for many, many reasons to see this film, but I really want to go back and see that because the, the aesthetic and the way it was done is so good. She's almost kind of like that little man that's on the Google Maps app, right? Where you can like place him or whatever. Because, you know, <laughs> if you're looking at Google Earth and it starts at the top and goes, zooms all the way down into like the Grand Canyon where the fuck you're looking at, right? So, I mean, I'm just going to assume that she's that same little avatar or whatever but yeah that was that was a great scene it was well shot and at first um there were there were some deaths in this movie and i was was watching it and i was like oh okay the effects are going to be a little questionable maybe right and um and then even during that first like real death scene i think you know we're talking about one of the true not was dying and they were sort of like phasing in and out and i was just like ugh, that doesn't really look really good to me but even in that one particular death, it started to look better and better as it went on. I think it was just my initial reaction with it. Oh, yeah, because I didn't have a problem with that at all. I thought it was cool. And I'm usually really anal about effects like that. And, but I mean, it only just for a split second, I was just like, well, this is what's going to look like and I'm not going to enjoy it. But then, you know, like shortly after that, you know, we had that whole scene where she's going to investigate that, that girl's house like you were just talking about. And I thought that was an amazing effects moment in that movie and a movie that didn't have a whole lot of like cgi effects i say that but i think they have to recreate that entire (sighs) of the overlook and who knows Uh, there's a lot of invisible effects in this film you know that's part of it though is that like you had that that villain and you see all this 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 darkness and what they're capable of but you can also empathize with them somehow Mm -hmm. and yet and you're afraid of them so this is kind of unique in this film and that you're afraid And you're creeped out by these villains and yet they keep losing. Like at every step they keep losing and you're like, yes, yes. You're like rooting for them to lose, but you still empathize with them. And which Stephen King is really good at. You know, she goes after that little girl. You're like, oh shit, that little girl's going to get so fucked, man. Like Mm -hmm. this, this chick is, and to see her, you know, basically kicked out of the little girl's mind like that. And this is first time actress, uh, Kylie Curran. And she was amazing. Oh, I mean, she was. Um, she was very, very good. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't. I don't know. We're kind of all over the place on this review, guys. I'm sorry, but uh, obviously we dug the shit out of it, and we plan on buying it and showing it to everyone that will see it. <laughs> and I think that so. happens when, whenever we like a movie a lot. I think we we have a lot to say, and sometimes we just sort of like just jump all over the place. I think that Doctor Sleep is a movie that we would revisit in the future and talk about. You know. In a longer, oh, yeah. a, a bigger scope, right? We could we could deep dive into this in ways that we can't deep dive into The Shining, right? Yeah, because there's just so much more human element to mine there. I think. Um, one more thing I wanted to point out before we move on to anything else, as far as the acting goes, is I really love Cliff Curtis a lot. <laughs> From uh, yeah, we we talked about him in Sunshine, right? And he's in Fear of the Walking Dead. I just think yep. he's like super handsome. I don't know. I love him. I love him a lot. So I was happy to he's see. He's very Cliff Curtis uh, in this. soulful, and he was different here. Yeah, and I, uh, it's a good character. He's a good actor. Yeah. I always enjoy seeing him. And I think as far as like characters go, too, the the other one that I liked quite a bit was Snakebite Andy, right? Played by oh wow that Emily was so cool. Lind. yeah they really set that up like that she was going to be a bigger deal uh-huh. and several times when I watched this film I thought wow I feel like I'm watching a mini series you know like the haunting of Hill House or something like this is where the episode would have ended and stuff and I wonder if he was just used to that cadence but yeah this could have been a longer mini series easily I almost want like a director's cut that's like twice as long <laughs> you know. You're talking about the heavy handedness of like the the shining call outs. And I think a lot of that is toward the end of the movie. Right. And I will say that the first like two thirds of this movie are better than the end for me. Like the, the very, very end is great. I like that. It was super emotional of her talking to her mom and then going into the bathroom or whatever, like Dan. But yeah. um, everything involving the true knot as a group to me was a much better story than like going back to face your past demons at the overlook. Right. Which is something that didn't really happen in the novel, obviously. So, well, he didn't really do it in the movie. They didn't really. He wasn't there to face his demons. He had already faced them. He was there to trap her. Right, but he still, at the same time, got to make peace with his dad a little bit. Right, they had a whole conversation and shit. You know, I mean, like, do you know who played him? No, I was hoping it was Jim Carrey, but no. That was the dad from. Haunting of Hill House, as well as the kid from E.T. 
That's Henry Thomas? It was Henry Thomas in makeup. Are you fucking kidding me? No. <laughs> Holy shit. I read I the didn't cast when that. I got home. I, I didn't know either. I, I read the cast, the wiki, when I got home. And I was like, that was Henry Thomas? <laughs> Yeah, so did you feel like it was a two and a half hour movie? Did you feel that it was long? Uh yeah, I did, but it just that doesn't really bother me. I yeah. was aware the time had passed. I was like, wow, it's been a while. I've been in the theater a while. I mean it didn't seem to me like a very long movie. I knew going into it, and I, I went to go see this with my mom, and uh I was just like, Yeah, it's two and a half hours. And she's like, What? And I'm like, you know, it's fine. But yeah. Even she didn't think that it seemed that long it was just a, a really well-made well-paced movie and i we can uh, we can thank him for that too because yeah. he directed wrote and edited this movie oh well well we've given our ratings on it it's chris a 4.5 and me a five star so definitely go check it out um with that being said uh box office results for this weekend have come out and dr sleep raked in about 14 million dollars oh yeah and its budget was pretty large for a horror movie at like 50 million yeah so, so I, everyone go and see it multiple times because this is uh we vote with our dollars man and i really want this movie to succeed i want this to be a success story because it's really good i just read an article on vanity fair online someone had posted it to twitter and they were like well stephen keen's success ends here and i'm like what the fuck does that even mean you know i mean so we're having this like stephen king renaissance of sorts and his movies are making a lot of money but i don't think you can say that you know his success is going to stop at this particular point and not to mention this movie made 14 million dollars this weekend we have seen word of mouth movies sprout up all over time and they come back and just like make shit tons of money this is how the first yeah yeah, this is how the first it made all its money i think it's probably how the shining made its money too i I, yeah i would assume and i you know was reading this and they were like well it's such a disappointment at 14 million dollars so i went and looked up the other box office numbers that came in second this weekend the first movie is Midway, and it made seventeen million. So I just don't think it was a really big movie weekend for people. No, no, and I read that too. That it was just not a good movie. Uh, it was not a good weekend for for movie theaters in general. I think that in the long run, this movie will make some money, and I think that people will discover it maybe later on on Blu-ray or streaming or whatever they watch movies on. And I think that people are going to appreciate it and talk about it for a long time. And I think eventually it's going to be considered a classic, just like The Shining is today. Yeah, I think so, too. So, guys, if you've seen Dr. Sleep, let us know what you think of the movie and our little hot take here. You can do that on social media at the Film Flamers on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Or you can email us at tiredqueens at filmflamers.com or call us on our hotline at 972-666-7733. We'd love to hear your voice and we will play those recordings on our Shooting the Flames episode next month. Well, guys, you still have an episode to look forward to this month from us. We are doing a deep dive into Interview with the Vampire. That'll be out next week. Head over to patreon.com slash the film flamers to check out all of our bonus content, including an extra hot take this month on the movie The Lighthouse. Starring Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson. And a mermaid. And a mermaid. Vagina. <laughs> Anyway, guys, go and see Dr. Sleep. Don't overlook the sequel. Oh my god, you're so fucking punny in this episode. I can't. (laughs) I just can't with you right now. (laughs) Well, until next time, guys. Sweet sweet dreams. dreams. Well, hi there. (laughs) I literally sent myself an email with all the puns that I could think of. (laughs) 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 Oh, shit. Fans will be finding new things to like about this film forever and ever and ever and ever. Don't overlook the sequel and the acting really shines. Jesus. Loser. Archive. Shut up. (laughs) (laughs) Sony. It's content.